absolutely gorgeous day outside. Uh, the bees are out there and they're, they're moving around, but I, I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes the honeybee such an amazing creature and what uh, what's really so special about the honeybee. Um, you know, and it, it's a complicated question because there's a lot of pollinators out there and there's a lot of really wonderful pollinators out there, you know, beautiful ones like the monarch butterfly or all the different uh, species of Lepidoptera, which is the genus of both butterflies and moths. And then there's, there's other bees, there's bumblebees, there's, there's carpenter bees. Uh, some people don't like carpenter bees as much, but, but they are a really good pollinator. And some bees like the bumblebee are actually much, much better at pollinating than the honeybee. Um, and on top of that, uh, you know, honeybees sting. So most people kind of look at that and they're like, well, butterflies don't sting. So can't we just deal with butterflies that are really pretty and not have the bees around them? Then we could be a lot happier. And that requires a little bit of perspective on it because, you know, if you start looking at flying stingy things. There's a lot of things that we run a, a swarm hotline with the colonial beekeepers. Before I keep going, I, I should say that this is a cooperative effort between the colonial beekeepers, the, uh, the Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Master Naturalist Program as well. So this presentation is kind of a bit uh, from all three of those organizations. Uh, but when you start looking at flat yellow and black flying things that sting, there's a whole bunch of different ones that really um that that are out there and so we get we run a swarm hotline and i get a lot of calls about uh well i've got i've got a swarm of bees out here and well what do they look like well it's it's three or four bees and they're trying to get outside of my they're, they're inside my house and they're trying to get outside uh get outside and my answer to that will open the window and let them out and let them go back to nature uh, because swarms of bees are it's a cloud um and there are usually a thousands of bees in there. Um, and sometimes what people are singing, seeing is they say, well, I stepped on some ground bees and they came up and they stung me. And uh, so I don't like honeybees a whole lot. And well, if they're on the ground, they're probably not honeybees. Uh, more, more likely they're yellow jackets, which are a very aggressive species. Uh, and they sting a lot. They don't die when they sting you. So there's nothing that really is a behavioral constraint to them stinging you. So, you know, they, sometimes it just seems like they want to sting you for the heck of it. But, um, and they're a lot more aggressive than, than honeybees are. But we confuse wasps and hornets sometimes with bees. And, and it's not hard to see that because they look very, very similar. You know, over here on your, on the right-hand side of your screen, there are honeybees in each one of those pictures are they're kind of much smaller than the carpenter bee at the top or the bumblebee at, in the bottom that are the much larger bees in those photos and then you have um other things on the left that are also not bees uh you've got the european hornet that is not the murder hornet uh it's smaller than the asian hornet that everyone's calling the murder hornet and you've also got other wasps on there the, like the uh like the Paper wasp, uh, you'll see those around your house a lot, the bald face hornet and the uh, yellow jacket. Now, of all of those, uh, the only one that, that's really a problem most of the time are the yellow jackets because they're so aggressive. The paper wasps, most people don't like those. Those are the kind that uh, typically will set up a yeah, honey type structure on the underside of your eaves. And, um, and we'll, uh, and you'll see it up there. It's a, it's kind of a brown tan paper structure right on the underside of your eaves, and and that's where they'll hang out. And most people want to get rid of those. And my answer to that is, if you're going in and out of a door that's right by that, then you're probably going to be disturbing them, and you're probably going to not mix well. So you probably want to get rid of that. But if that's not the case. Uh, you might and the and they make their nest maybe on the back side of the house where no one ever goes under your eaves there. You might want to leave them there. And the reason for that is wasps and hornets are omnivores. They will eat both plants and they'll eat uh, other insects. And what kind of other insects? Well, they eat mosquitoes. Uh, so having a healthy population of 
hornets or wasps around your house is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if they're not aggressive. And paper wasps, as long as you aren't right by their nest, um, and sometimes even if you are right by their nest and you aren't waving your hands around or, or acting threatening to them, they'll just go about their business. Same thing with a bald-faced hornet, which is on the uh, upper left-hand side of that um, of this chart here. Um, there are there are um, I have these set up a whole nest in my yard one time, and I actually left them there because they are really good at eating mosquitoes, and it's a natural deterrent for me having mosquitoes in my yard. Uh, this is what a bald-faced hornet's nest looks like. Um, one of them is in a Bradford pear tree. Uh, that's a uh, that's a mature one, and the other one is on the eaves underneath the house. Uh, these did a fantastic job in both locations of um, of controlling the mosquitoes in the area right around there. And come the fall, the um, the females from there will go out. They'll lay some eggs in a different location and uh, overwinter in the larval egg or chrysalis form, and then. Uh, come the spring, they will come back out and reestablish the colony. So those colonies don't overwinter like that. They they actually die out once the colder weather hits. But having those around, as long as they're not in a high traffic area, is actually a really good thing. The uh, one in the Bradford pear tree, I could stand right in front of that, maybe two feet away from it, right underneath it, talking on the phone, and the, the hornets didn't bother me at all because I wasn't bothering them. Um, so not every time you see something is uh, is grounds for we need to get rid of these hornets or these wasps. Now, yellow jackets, I'll, I'll, I'll excuse that. But the rest of them, as as long as you're not really bothering them, they don't want to bother you. They, they want to stay out of your way. So the stinging thing isn't really so much of a problem if you can learn not to um, offend each other, I guess is the best way to, to be looking at that. Um, with all the different types of bees that we have around us, we've got 436 different types of native bees in Virginia, of which the honeybee is not one of them. The honeybee is not a native bee in Virginia. It's native. It originally, we think they originated in Southeast Asia, but it is native to Europe and the kinds that we most commonly have around here. And, um, and was brought over by the settlers at Jamestown. Actually, in the second, in the first major resupply to Jamestown, they brought over hives of bees so they could uh, establish some bees and could have some honey over here in the New World. Of all of those bees and all of the uh, all of the uh, 436 native bees around here, the great majority of them, almost all of them, are solitary bees. That means that they kind of live out their lives by themselves. They establish individual nests. The Each female will establish its own nest and then uh, go ahead and uh, lay their eggs, provision them with some nectar and pollen uh, to come out of there, and then will go on their way. Very few of them have some sort of social behavior. Sweat bees are a good example of native bees that are have some uh, some semi-social types of behaviors. Bumblebees are a little primitively eusocial, meaning highly specialized. And then honeybees are the only ones that are highly eusocial, meaning that they have specific jobs that each one of the individual organisms has in their society, in their colony. Now, to put this in kind of perspective, um, let's let's talk about mammals. Uh, maybe a wolverine would not be a very social type of animal. Uh, maybe more of a lone animal. Most mammals are at least somewhat social, like wolves or coyotes or deer are somewhat social. And but then. Us humans, we are highly eusocial. We have all sorts of differentiation of responsibilities and jobs within our culture, uh, be it engineers or teachers or librarians or uh, fighter pilots or uh, construction workers. There's all sorts of different jobs that we specialize for in our culture. One person doesn't do everything. And honeybees are the same way. So when you start thinking about honeybees and understanding their behavior, 
it's not really helpful to think of them as an individual organism. It's more common or it's more, um, it's easier to understand their behavior if you start thinking of them as a super organism. The collection of, of, of all of the individual organisms together in that colony will act in a way that kind of resembles that colony making collective decisions together. And they do make a lot of collective decisions together uh, as a super organism, whether it's time to uh, swarm or reproduce or whether uh, or what they're doing, what the queen should do, what the other bees uh, need to do, why they would sacrifice themselves to protect the hive and die because if a honeybee stings you, it's going to die. But they'll do that to sacrifice themselves in protection of the larger superorganism. Um, and it's so if you're trying to understand that, just understanding the individual behavior, it really doesn't make much sense. But if you think of it from the perspective of the larger sense of the superorganism, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, honeybees in the wild tend to occupy cavities. Now they occupy cavities in colder areas, in tropical areas, they'll actually build their honeycombs outside on cliffs, on uh, outside on trees, like what you see on the upper right hand uh, photo. But most of them in Europe at least will uh, reside inside of cavities of trees, uh, like, the, uh, like the photo there in the uh, top middle. The photo on the left and on the bottom, on bottom center are actually photos from Hampton that I took about just over a week ago, taking bees out of a hollow log that they had established a colony in there and drawn out some absolutely beautiful honeycomb in there. And then the, uh, the homeowner decided that they, uh, that they were getting a little bit too active and they wanted them removed. So we went down and, and uh, took them out of there. Just wonderful, gentle bees and lots of gorgeous honeycomb. But that's how they live in the wild. And so uh, every once in a while, when they live there, think about that cavity in that tree. That cavity doesn't get bigger or smaller based on the needs of the bees. It just is. So around this time of year with all of the nectar flow that's going on and all of the abundance of resources, um, the queens are actually laying 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day massively building up the colony. So she has enough workers to go out and harvest all of those resources. And they're bringing back all of that nectar and they're turning it into honey and they're storing it away in there. And after a while, they start running out of elbow room. You know, think back to Schoolhouse Rock. They start running out of that elbow room and they start thinking, well, we, we need to uh, do something about it. So what they do is uh, they end up swarming and they go out and half the, col the queen takes half the colony and they go away. And the remaining half of the colony stays there and continues growing, building up new queens and making new queens while the old queen goes out and uh, relocates uh, with about half of the bees to another location that the scouts have found. Um, now, the way that we have adapted in our, in, um, in beekeeping and in in our society for hundreds of years of keeping bees is we tried to replicate them. And originally that was with what we called skeps. And skeps were nothing more than wicker baskets or, or large pots that were overturned that we allowed the bees to come into. They would create their, uh, their honeycomb in there. They would, um, they would lay, uh, make their young in there. They would fill it up with honey. And then at the end of the season, we would turn it over. We'd rip it apart. We'd take out all of that honeycomb crush it down, remove the honey, and uh, and then we would have all of that honey. The only kind of downside of this is, well, it's a huge downside to the bees because their home was destroyed. Uh, it's not a very sustainable way of doing it, and, um, and it, it's really tough on the bees. So we started looking around for different ways to do it. And about uh, 160 years ago, uh, around the time of Lincoln, um, a reverend in New England named Lorenzo Langstroth noticed that if bees had about between three eighths of an inch to a quarter inch to move around, they would move around in that space really well. If they didn't have quite a quarter inch, they couldn't move through the space. And if they had more than three eighths of an inch space to move through, they would fill that area up with burr comb. And so using that, um, 
Using that knowledge, he built removable frame boxes or hives that he could keep his bees in, that he could remove the frame, look at the bees, and then put the frame back in, and it would be non-destructive. And so he could harvest honey out of that without destroying the hive. He could inspect his bees without destroying the hive, and it worked really well for him. And so now almost all of the hives follow Langstroth's design for or basic idea for managing that bee space and being able to uh, control our bees within these boxes. And so now I can manage and give the bees more room by simply adding on another box and maybe keep them from swarming and taking off and just build their colony even bigger. And so that's what you see here, a couple of uh, different examples of Langstroth hives and my apiaries and a frame off of one of, uh, off of one of the hives. Um, within the hives, there's all sorts of differentiations like what I spoke about earlier. Not only are there the differences between boys and girls in the hives, but there's also the morphology distinction between the queen and the other females. Um, the queen is a really, really interesting creature. Um, she emerges um, from her cell as an adult 16 days after her egg was laid. About five days after emerging, she has grown up enough that it is time for her to go out on her one and sometimes only mating flight. Um, and she will go up to what we call drone congregation areas. And the best way to think about it is a big bar in the sky. All these drones, all these males are hanging out up there, just flying around together in the sky. And she will fly up into that area and she will successively mate with dozens of drones, one right after the other. There's no, um, there's no attachment or, or uh, sobbing after the past uh, drone. He, she forgets about him. Once he's done, he falls off dead. Uh, it's a one-time good deal for him and less than 1% of uh, all drones that are ever created actually get a chance to um, get a chance to mate with a queen, but there's a chance. Uh, so they go up there and she will mate with, with dozens of drones and she will collect all of that sperm that they give her and she will put them in a special organ in her body called the spermatheca. It's down in her abdomen. And when she comes back to the hive, she can control how she releases those sperm, which is a really, um, well, it's a, it's a really interesting way of doing it. Uh, humans don't have that kind of control. So she can go in and when she lays an egg, she can choose whether she fertilizes the egg or doesn't fertilize the egg. And that type of sexual determination is called haplodiploidy. Now, if you think back to your biology, all of us humans are diploid organisms. We have two sets of chromosomes and it's, a ch it's the differences in our 23rd chromosome, which we call our sex chromosome, it, which determines whether we are male or female. If you have two X chromosomes, you're female. If you have an X and Y chromosome, you're male. And so, but with the bees, with haplodiploidy, if she lays an unfertilized egg, that is only going to have one set of chromosomes. And so that's gonna be a male. But if she lays a fertilized egg that will have two sets of chromosomes and, the, uh, and she will, um, and uh, that will be a female. So uh, the sex determination is a little bit different. It's the same type of se uh, sex determination that's shared in the order Hymenoptera, which includes wasps, bees, and ants. So the kind of neat thing about, uh, about drones or male bees is that drones don't have a father, but they do have a grandfather. The, um, the life cycle for, uh, for the bees then looks a little bit something like this. So on the left-hand side, you see an egg that's inside one of the cells in my hives. Uh, the queen lays one egg in there in the center. And after about, um, two and a half days, that egg will hatch and it will turn into a larva. And just for uh, reference, uh, since most people are very familiar with the uh, caterpillar and, and butterfly life cycle, uh, the larval form of the, um, of the butterfly is the caterpillar. Uh, so it will, that larva will be fed. Um, they start off feeding the larva 
royal jelly. It's this wonderful substance that has everything in it that that larva needs to fully develop and turn into a fully developed uh, um, bee, an adult bee. And then after about two to three days of feeding it only royal jelly, they'll start working in a little bit of pollen, a little bit of nectar, a little bit of water into that bee's diet until by day nine, that larva will have grown so big that it will have filled up that cell and they will cap it off with a wax capping. It will spin a cocoon in there, just the same way that a caterpillar will spin a cocoon when it comes time for that caterpillar to pupate. And so it pupates inside of that cocoon for 12 days until day 21 when that uh, female worker bee will emerge from the cell and will go out and start uh, doing the things that worker bees do. Uh, drones take a little bit longer to do uh, go through the whole cycle. They don't, um, they're a little bit larger. They don't uh, pupate until day 10 and then it takes them a little bit longer to pupate and uh, they emerge uh, two weeks later as an adult. But here's Here's a really cool thing. When the queen is laying her eggs inside of the hive, and this is where we're talking about a super organism and not individual ones, it's all dark inside the hive. So she goes around and she's feeling her way around. If she feels a normal size cell, she thinks, ah, they want me to lay a, a, a worker egg in here. So she will lay a fertilized egg in there. But if she feels a little bit larger cell, then the uh, then she'll think, ah, oh, I need to lay an unfertilized egg in here because they want me to lay a drone egg in here. And so she'll do that. And it's all by feel and it's all done in the dark. And we all think about the queen ruling the colony, but it's the workers who are making that determination on what kind and what size cells to build. So it's not just the queen who is running the whole colony. The workers have quite a bit of say in the whole thing too. And here's the other thing. When the workers decide that they are running out of space in the colony, it's the workers who decide, or the queen isn't measuring up and she uh, quits producing as well as she should. It's the workers who decide that they are going to uh, uh, make a new queen. And so what they'll do is if they, that, that, egg that was laid by the queen. We all know, I just told you that it hatches on day two, about two and a half. They start feeding it royal jelly for about two and a half days until they start working in the other things, uh, the pollen, the nectar, the, the water. If those workers only feed it royal jelly and don't work in anything else, that, that larva is going to grow much, much faster. And, by, and they're going to have to make the cell much bigger. And by day eight, not day nine, that larva will have grown so big that it completely fills up that even larger cell and they'll have to cap it off. And then in only eight days of pupation under there, it will emerge as a fully grown queen bee. And the only difference between whether the egg that's laid turns into a worker that lives for about 45 days total or into a queen that can live for up to seven years is what that larva is fed when it is developing during those six-ish days that it's developing. So I tell kids, if you think it doesn't matter what you eat when you're a developing larva or developing kid, take a look at the bees. It absolutely matters. If you eat the good stuff and keep your body, uh, that will allow your body to grow better and fully develop. But if you just eat junk food, your body's not going to fully develop in the way that you want it to. So what do you want to do? Be royalty or be, uh, or be a worker? Think they think about it a little bit, or I hope they do. So you can see a little bit of the differences in morphology here. Uh, on your left side, you can see the normal size of the honeycomb and some of the cells that have been covered over with a wax capping. Those are the uh, larvae that are pupating right now. So they're uh, pupa, they're not really larvae anymore, and they are getting ready to uh, to emerge as adult bees. But you also see some rather larger cells that look like a little bit like peanuts. Those are examples of queen cells. And you can see how much bigger that they are. But what you can also see in here is a difference between male and female bees. Drones, which are male bees, are much bigger than the worker bees that are female. And you can see that example right here where I've circled some of the male bees on your slides that uh, so you can identify them a little bit more. Only two eyes uh, and they're much bigger. 
as opposed to the females who have five eyes and uh and their bodies are just much bulkier they're the kind of linebackers of the of the of the hive um within the hive there's lots of different jobs and all of them are done by the females um the females do all of the work in the hive whether it is being the nurse bees and taking care of the larva or whether it's the housekeeping bees that build the honeycomb and take care of the uh take care of cleaning it and making sure that everything is built up correctly the females do all of that the females guard the hive uh males don't have singers so it's the females that guard and make sure only the bees from that hive come in and that if a bear were to come and attack the hive and try and get into it they would defend the hive and uh and sacrifice themselves to defend the hive that that's all the females and when it comes time to foraging and the females are go out and forage and it's only the workers that go out and forage um the females the workers will uh forage up to three miles away from the hive they'll visit 50 to 100 flowers in a flight gather that nectar and that pollen and then bring it bring it on back which is a lot of work i i tell people you know for for the size difference between uh, bees and me, that would be like me running up to Richmond, picking up, going to 50 to 100 grocery stores, picking up my groceries, running back here with them, not in the car, and then turning around and running back to Richmond and doing that a couple of times a day. It wouldn't take very long of that for me to get pretty tired. In fact, the workers and the foragers work so hard that in about three weeks of foraging, they literally work themselves to death. And the queen, to make up for that, is laying 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day to keep her workforce big enough to, to handle all the work. On the right-hand side here, you see a little bit of what we call festooning, where the bees look like they're acrobats clinging onto each other. But what they're really doing is, I'm, and I'm kind of interrupting them in this photo, they're, uh, they're building out new honeycomb in the hive. And they're clinging to each other to get that, uh, to get all of that um, construction done correctly. Uh, the drones, uh, the only role for the males in the hive is to uh, eat. And what I tell the kids is take the queen on dates, um, which means that come the winter time, when the queens aren't going out on their mating flights anymore, there's really not a role for the drones in the hive. And they have a set amount of honey that they have to get through the winter with. And that's it. That's all they have. So come the late fall, early winter, the workers will actually kick the drones out of the hive and the drones will die outside. They won't have access to food or anything and, and they'll die. So when the hive goes through the winter, it is only female bees that go through the uh, winter with the hive. How can they do that? Because the queen already has all of the sperm that she needs stored in her spermatheca. And come the springtime, when it's time to uh, make drones so they can spread the genetic material of the hive, she can lay uh, unfertilized eggs again and they will carry her genetics on to, uh, to hopefully the next queen that they mate with when they're out there flying. Um, so this is where I talk a little bit about getting into why is the honeybee special? Um, and what I like to talk to people about is think about the cuddliest, most wonderful creature that you can imagine in the world, uh, something that would never hurt something else. And when I talk to kids about that, most of them will come back with um, with a bunny rabbit or their dog or something like that. And, and those are great. But if you think about that, that bunny rabbit, if it gets into your garden, is going to just tear apart the carrots and the lettuce and the other vegetables that you have in your garden. And it's going to, because it needs to eat. And in eating, it's going to damage those, uh, those uh, plants. Similarly, if you let your dog out in the yard and there's a squirrel right there, that squirrel's going to be better start running because if the dog gets a hold of it, that squirrel's going to be toast. Um, and you know, all organisms are like that. We have to destroy other living things in order for us to have the food uh, for us to survive, but not the honeybee. The honeybee is unique among almost every other organism on earth in that in the normal course of its life, it does not harm another living organism, but only helps other living organisms. And think about it, that honeybee just goes around to flower and flower and and it moves pollen around. Now it collects some of it and 
So when it goes to the next flower, some of it falls off and, and it collects some there and it, and it moves on. So it's doing that pollination service, but the flowers benefit from that. It's not hurting the flower to do it. And in order to entice the bee to come there, the flowers create pollen or create nectar to entice the pollinators to come there, to entice the honeybee to come there. So the honeybee is not harming the plants at all and only is helping the organisms that are out there, the plants, to, uh, to reproduce. The only time that a honeybee would ever hurt something is in self-defense if it feels threatened. So if you're around a honeybee and you're going like this, that's probably pretty threatening to the honeybee, just the same way that if a giant came around me and was swatting its hand around me, I would feel pretty threatened. Um, so if we can avoid those negative interactions with honeybees, they don't have a, a vested interest in harming us. In fact, they have a vested interest in leaving us alone, which is why I can go up to honeybees who are pollinating flowers and calmly put my hand right next to them and never get stung because they're too busy doing their thing. You know, visiting 50 to 100 flowers, carrying all that pollen and nectar back to the hive and then coming back out and doing it again. But the real reason why we care about honeybees is because our food web depends on honeybees. The way that we produce our food, not just in America, but in the world, depends greatly on honeybees. And we depend on them to pollinate about 80% of our crops. Everything that's not wind pollinated, we pretty much depend on the honeybee. Now, why is that? Because I already told you that bumblebees are much better pollinators, right? But bumblebees don't live in aggregate in, in uh, highly used social groups, right? They live uh, primitively use social. So they, they don't aggregate together in such large numbers. And let's think about how we do agriculture in the U.S. And, and, and around the world. We tend to have orchards, right? Orchards of one kind of fruit for acres and acres of one kind of orchard. So let's take, well, any anything that you think of. You know, when, when a farmer is going to plant an orchard, they're going to plant all of that varietal of fruit, whether it's apples or whether it's almonds or whether it's pears or grapes and they're going to plant acres of that well that's great while that while that crop is flowering but what 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 about when it's not flowering is there any food around there for the native pollinators who might live there in that area to, to forage on and the answer is really no so during part of the year it's a bonanza of food but during the rest of the year, really not so much. So we don't, with the way that we practice our agriculture with large monoculture crops, we need to move in the pollinators in order to, in order to do that. We're not talking about small family farms that have, you know, a, half, a quarter acre over here that, that's our orchard. And then, you know, an acre over here that maybe has our, uh, has our corn and, and things along those lines. We're talking about huge operations, the way that we run our agriculture. And because of that, that causes one of the lar well, the largest migration in terms of organisms in the world. And that is the migration of honeybees across and around the United States. It starts off before Valentine's Day. All of the uh, all of the hives being moved out to California for the almond heart, uh, for the almond pollination, and then they move up to cherries, and then they move to apples and plums and all sorts of different uh, um, crops that are need to those pollinators around because in that almond grove there's nothing but almonds, you know. So you move them in there, and so they pollinate that, and then they move it on, and it's this huge migration around the United States. And the byproduct of that is those bees are always engaged. Not only are they pollinating, but they're also collecting that nectar and they make a lot of honey. And that's how you can get the apple blossom honey. How do you get that? Well, because you know, uh, uh, you know that those bees were in the middle of a sea of apples and uh, apple trees, and they were harvest or they were foraging on nothing but apple blooms. So you can call that apple honey or orange blossom honey, same thing. Whereas my bees go out three miles around my house. Well, right now they're probably foraging on uh, tulip poplar trees, especially, but they're foraging on all sorts of different things. So my honey around my house is just wildflower honey.
But let's talk about this a little bit more so you understand how big this whole thing is. Let's just talk about almonds because almonds are one of the uh, one of the biggest drivers for this, though not the only driver. And almonds are initially um, native to Persia is our best guess, but then we're domesticated and spread throughout the world. So in California, especially, we have the largest almond production in the world. 90% of the world's almonds come from California. I, when I was in Afghanistan, I sometimes I would be offered some almonds uh, uh, by some uh, locals that I would meet with. And the funny thing is those almonds probably originated in California where I grew up. So the bloom time for these almond trees is Valentine's Day uh, starting there and goes into March, so about two to three weeks. Now during that time, it is still winter in California. They're waking up, but certainly no pollinators, even if they had pollinators around there, exist in large enough numbers to be taking care of the uh, of the of the uh, pollen trees. Why? Well, because we've got about just shy, and this these numbers are all from about three years ago, just shy of a million acres of almond orchards in California, right? And on those almond orchards, those, uh, those uh, 800,000 acres of almond orchards, the average number of trees on those uh, acres are 112 trees per acre which comes out to about 90 million almond trees that we have out in California. Now, if you take that and you figure that there are about 28,000 flowers on each tree, that means about two and a half trillion flowers need to be pollinated in order for those almond farmers to be successful. So they've got to have the ability in about two to three weeks time to pollinate two and a half trillion flowers. That's a lot of flowers. So how do they do that? Well, they figure that, you know, if you have each hive is about at that time, they're just starting to build up their numbers, but about 10,000 bees in a hive or so, you need about two hives per acres. And that comes out to about 1.6 million hives that you're going to need. And that's going to add to get all of those hives in there. And you can see the, the picture of the trucks there that are just loaded up with hives. That requires between three to 6,000 flatbed trucks bringing in all of those hives. And now you start to understand why this is such a huge migration, why it's the largest one in the world, because those hives don't hang out there. You know, because once those almond trees are done blooming, there's that's a veritable desert there. There aren't any, those almond growers don't have little uh, flower patches that are blooming year round that, handle the forage that's necessary for all those organisms. So they have to then take, the beekeepers have to take those hives and move it to another area. And it's a huge operation. They keep bees in a much, much different way than I do. But without those bees being there, we wouldn't have almonds and we wouldn't have apples or we wouldn't have them in the numbers that we do or we couldn't continue to farm the way that we do. Um, so it would be a lot less efficient and it would be, we would have a lot less food production uh, in America and around the world. And oh, by the way, you know, what are we, how close are we to 8 billion people in the world and still going up? We need to be efficient with our farming practices. So if we're going to be efficient with it, we've got to figure out how to, uh, how to deal with this. Now here in Hampton Roads, um, our bees aren't in, for the most part, in a monoculture crop situation which actually is much healthier for the bees. Uh, they, get a, they get a variety of different, um, oops, let me go back. They get a variety of uh, different flowers all throughout the year. And the neat thing is that um, we, if we just look at native plants, we've got plants that bloom at different times all throughout the year. Now the best time for beekeepers perspective and for the bees perspective starts in about late March and goes until the beginning of June. And that's called the, what we call the nectar flow. And that's when most of our trees around us are actually blooming. Starts with the red maple and then everything else starts uh, coming to bloom, the red bud and, and the oaks are in bloom. And, and then uh, our best nectar producer around here, the tulip poplar, we've got fantastic nectar resources around here. So what, what, what happens with that? Well, 
my queens start laying uh, their eggs starting in early February in larger numbers to have the numbers of foragers that they're going to need at the end of March to be able to go out and harvest these resources and bring them back and have the hive uh, prosper and grow. So there's a lot that goes into this. And right now my hives are just filling up with, with nectar that they're bringing back. And so I have to keep adding new boxes to them so they have enough room to put that nectar away and keep and keep working so they don't swarm. And if they swarm, then we, then we can deal with that a little bit more. But, um, but because of that, when people talk to me about, well, how can we help the bees? And I talk to them about planting different things. I tell them to, um, to focus on plants that are going to be blooming during the summer and the fall. Why during the summer and the fall? Because up until the end of June, there's such, or beginning of June, there's such a wide variety of resources out there from a nectar and pollination standpoint that the bees really don't need help and neither do any other pollinator. There's tons of resources out there for them. But come the uh, middle of June, all the way into the fall, those trees stop blooming and now the pollinators need help. So now I'm starting to look at different plants that bloom in succession that I can always have something blooming in my garden. So I can always have something that's going to be available for the bees to be foraging on. Um, the other thing that, uh, that uh, is worth uh, talking about here and going back a little bit to the swarms. Uh, you can see some examples and all but one of these are, are my pictures of swarms of bees. When you have a swarm of bees, remember that in a hive, in one of my, in any of my hives right now, I've got 10, 20,000 bees in a hive. So if half of them are leaving, that's several thousand bees that are leaving to go find a new home, right? So they are going to group together and they get really excited. They, they start making a new queen before they decide to swarm. They go out and they send scout bees out to communicate, uh, to find a new location for them to go. And they do that days before and they start uh, communicating to each other through waggle dances and other things like that that are a little bit outside the scope of this discussion. But then they all decide to go flying together about Two days, be two or three days before they decide to take off, they stop uh, feeding the queen so they can slim her down to flying weight and she can go flying with them. Well, the level of um, joy in the bees uh, about seeing the queen out and flying and being able to go flying with her is about like a uh, the level of joy of my daughter when we took her to Disneyland for the first time and she got to meet Minnie Mouse. I mean, they're just beside themselves. Um, so they clump around her. They want to protect her. They swarm all around her. And because she hasn't been flying sometimes in, in a year or more, she gets tired pretty easily. So she'll fly a short distance and then she'll stop and rest. And all of them will come together and group together around her to keep her warm, to make sure that she's safe. And that's why you will see them uh, flying around in a cloud of bees or clustering together in a big group like this. And then when they cluster together, they cluster together so much and there's so much weight there that they'll actually bend down the branch that they're on. In fact, the one, uh, the picture, the inset on the lower right, uh, they're at the end of a branch of tree uh, on the tree. They're actually bending it down uh, all the way down to the vertical because it's uh, so heavy with bees. So that's what you're seeing when you're uh, seeing a swarm. The um, the good thing about a swarm is right before the workers all leave, they gorge themselves on nectar and, and honey. And so they have enough energy for when they get to the new home to start drawing out honeycomb and they have enough energy for the flight. So these are about the most docile bees that you'll ever see in your life. Uh, and they're a great, uh, you know, that some beekeepers, you could go up to a swarm with, uh, without a veil or gloves on and, and just get them and collect them and take them away. They're not gonna be defensive at all. Um, we don't do that for the same reason that I don't drive my car without a seatbelt on. Uh, you just never know when you're gonna, um, gonna come across something that, that isn't under your control and might cause a problem. So I do wear a veil and gloves. Um, but if you ever do see a, a swarm around you, uh, please do call our swarm hotline. That number is 828-7707. And we'd be happy to send some beekeepers out to help you uh, uh, find those bees a better home.
Um, so what's hurting the bees right now? Uh, loss of habitat is a big thing. Um, remember that the biggest amount of habitat that they have um, or the best uh, foraging source is, are the trees that they have around here in the springtime. Those trees, mostly native trees, by the way, crepe myrtle trees, not native trees, don't produce pollen, don't produce nectar, not really good for pollinators at all. But our native trees are fantastic uh, for bees. And so when we have those, the bees can go out and they can forage really well. I have a friend who lives up in Lackey, uh, tucked back in amongst uh, the Yorktown battlefield and the forage available to her bees because uh, she's surrounded by the battlefield pretty much is just the best around here because she has all those trees around her. Well, what are we doing about that? Well, we're putting up subdivisions. This is one right here in York County that's that's going in and clearly we need houses. There's, there's a housing shortage right now, but the way that we're building these subdivisions is pretty destructive to the habitat because what we do is we go in with bulldozers and we clear all of the trees off of the lots everything, all of the vegetation, all of the native ones. By the way, this is just adjacent to uh, Newport News Park, which is um, which is a fantastic uh, uh, native area for native trees and for, for wildlife in our area. But when we denude it of all native vegetation like this, it destroys its ecological value. Um, and we don't go in and selectively harvest the trees and then build in there. We just take everything off. And then when we put something back up there, we, we fill it with lawns, which have no ecological value at all. And we fill it with ornamentals from Asia that have no local um, connection to our food web and are functionally useless to our food web. So we create a desert there. Um, and that harms not just honeybees, but pollinators and uh, pollinators in general in our area. The second thing that really hurts the bees is exposure to pesticides, uh, whether that's neonicotinoids uh, or pyrethroids. Now, neonicotinoids are a class of chemicals about, back in the 60s, uh, people got, just like they are today, really tired of squash bugs getting onto their cucurbits, like their zucchini or their cucumbers or, or things like that. And, and destroying the plants because what the squash bugs will do is they'll get underneath the, the leaves and the, and the stems on it and they will chew on the vascular tissue and suck out the sap and then they'll kill the plant. And so our researchers th said, wouldn't it be great if rather than broadcast spraying chemicals all over the area, we could treat this with something that would just be in the sap. So it would target the bugs that are chewing on the vascular tissue and just kill them and wouldn't be a threat to anything else. And they came up with neonicotinoids uh, neo and they work great against squash bugs and against other uh, aphids that, that suck on vascular tissue and suck on the, on the juices. The problem with them is that those uh, neonicotinoids do not, are not confined to just the vascular tissue in the plant. They cook the seed with it and then it's absorbed into the plant. And so it's there in the pollen and it's there in the nectar and it's all throughout the rest of the plant. So when the honeybees land on it, um, they lose, it doesn't, it's not enough to kill them, but it is enough to disrupt their sense of direction. And so the workers don't live as long. They don't always find their way back to the hive. In fact, they find their way back to the hive only 80% of the time as opposed to bees that haven't been exposed to neonicotinoids. Now that loss of 20% is significant for a hive and it does impact the hive, but even worse than that are the pyrethroids. What are pyrethroids? Um, pyrethroids are the uh, chemicals that are sprayed onto your property if you happen to employ a service that sprays for mosquitoes. Um, the, their, their sales pitch, if you talk to one of these companies goes something like this. Um, we derive our chemicals from the chrysanthemum flower. It's a naturally occurring chemical that exists in the uh, chrysanthemum flower. We just harness that and then we spray it out there and it coats the leaves on the plants. And so when a mosquito that can only fly a short distance before it needs to stop and rest lands on it, it gets some of that contact pesticide on it and it kills it. But it's not gonna hurt you uh, it's just fine for you. It's only going to affect the mosquitoes that fly around your yard. 
which they say, and then they put on a complete hazmat suit with a respirator before they ex uh, spray it out there because they don't want to be exposed to it. And oh, by the way, they forget about, they, they conveniently neglect to tell you that the EPA says that it's moderately to highly toxic to honeybees and other beneficial insects in your yard. So yes, you do get rid of the mosquitoes in your yard for a while, but it also is really good at killing all of the butterflies and the bees and the dragonflies and the animals that feed on them, like the songbirds. And so the songbirds will either get poisoned and die or it will, uh, it will kill off all of their food sources so they have to look elsewhere. And so as soon as all of the predators for the mosquitoes get eliminated, that chemical is worn off. And what's the first thing that comes back to your yard but mosquitoes. Um, so pyrethroids are not a really good answer for mosquito control. And I can talk about that a little bit uh, more later, but they are a really bad idea if you wanna have honeybees in your yard or if you wanna have other pollinators in your yard as well. So I would highly encourage you not to, uh, not to use pyrethroids in your yard. And then the third thing that affects the bees are parasites like the varroa destructor mite, which is a um, very well adapted parasite that feeds on the uh, fat tissue of the bees, which is kind of like their liver system. It's the fat cells. And, uh, and they're very effective at weakening the bees. And so right now it's not just, everyone probably heard about 10 years ago about colony collapse disorder. Colony collapse disorder is not caused by just one thing. It's kind of like piling the, um, the straws on the camel and it's a straw that breaks it camel's back, you know, between the pesticides and the monoculture crops and having poor nutrition for that or the loss of habitat. A Kate, you know, eventually we add on too many stressors that the bees are not able to handle that. And we start losing quite a few bees, um, or quite a few colonies of bees because of all of this. And it's really, it's, it's pretty dangerous for the, uh, for both the commercial beekeeping industry right now and the backyard beekeepers. So what can you do to help? Well, the biggest thing that you can do is plant bee-friendly flowers in your uh, yard, especially native plants. Uh, all of these, are, and just like most of the photos in this presentation, are photos that I take in and around my yard. Um, they're, you know, if you want bees in your yard, plant some great native plants in there. Plant uh, herbs like catnip, which bees love and mosquitoes hate. Plant, plant agastache or or mountain or goldenrod that is going to bloom in the uh, in the fall when the bees really are trying to build up their their winter stores. By the way, goldenrod does not cause any allergies at all. It's a very heavy pollen. It is not wind carried, unlike ragwort, which looks very similar. It's in the same family, but is wind carried, and that ragwort causes uh, causes allergies. You don't have to worry about uh, goldenrod causing any of your allergies. But there's a lot of different uh, varietals of plants that you can uh, plant in your yard that can bloom at different times and help bees out. And then reduce or eliminate uh, your use of pesticides. Um, you know, don't use pesticides, don't broadcast spray pesticides, certainly. Uh, if you need to use it for a specific purpose and it's targeted to that one thing, then use it, but then try not to use those. Uh, I don't. I used to, before I knew better and before I was keeping bees, I used to uh, have a, uh, a company come out and spray my yard for mosquitoes. I don't do that anymore. Um, and I did that because I didn't want mosquitoes in my yard, just like everyone else who, who doesn't want mosquitoes in their yard. But I still don't have mosquitoes in my yard. And how do I do that? I use targeted planting to cut down on the mosquitoes. I eliminated any standing water in my backyard or things that would uh, encourage standing water so um, so it would cut down on a breeding source and so I'm attacking the larval so cycle of the mosquito development. I use uh, mosquito dunks which are a great way to uh, target the mosquito and not anything else and then I use citronella oil uh, in, uh, in torches in my backyard when I'm going to be out there for a long time and that works just great and I don't have problems with mosquitoes in my yard and if you do the same thing, you can too. So that's really uh, my talk about honeybees, um, just under an hour. Uh, hopefully that was uh, somewhat helpful.
I'd like to leave the screen up, but I'd like to take any questions if uh, if anyone has any questions. Um, I have not seen any questions yet, but I was going to put that number up for the um, for the swarm hotline. Yes. Yeah. I, so I I'm sorry about that. I should should have that in here, and I don't, but. That number is 828-7707. And if somebody doesn't remember this number or they don't write it down, you can just look up uh, Colonial Bees and Beekeepers and it's right on the front page, right? Yeah, uh, there's a um, colonialbeekeepers.org, not com. And uh, there's a little button there that says, uh, swarms and you click on that and it gives you all the information right there. So I really appreciate everyone taking uh, their time out of what is an absolutely beautiful day to come in uh, and uh, learn something about honeybees. And if you do want to learn uh, any more, you can always contact the extension office at 890-4940 uh, to ask your questions and they'll pass them on to me. Uh, or you can uh, contact the Colonial Beekeepers and we'd be happy to, they'd be happy to answer them uh, there as well. Mm -hmm.